All right, we can go ahead and get started. So hello everyone, thanks for joining How to Better Identify HCCs in the H EHR. Um, my name is Jordan Leibvitz and I'm part of the marketing team here at IMO. Before we get started, I want to take care of a few items for those attending. First off, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to you after the, the session. Um, throughout the session, all attendees will be in listen-only mode. So if you have any questions, type them into the chat box um, and we'll get to them at the end where we'll host a Q&A. We get too many questions and for some reason yours is not addressed, we'll be able to follow up with you after the presentation. Today we have two presenters from IMO, June Bronert, Senior Director of Global Clinical Services, and David Arco, Senior Product Manager. As mentioned before, if you have any questions or comments while our presenters are speaking, please type them into the questions box on your control panel. And with all of this being said, I'm gonna pass it on over to June. Thank you, Jordan. And welcome everyone. Let me begin with a little background about IMO. IMO has been the primary driver behind clinical interface terminology. We began in 1994 when few clinicians were even using electronic health records. Today, we are the premier supplier of clinical interface terminology to the US and English speaking market with more than 70% of acute care facilities, 4,500 hospitals, and over 500,000 daily clinician users in the U.S. alone. I've gotten to see the incredible transformation of our business in the industry over my last decade at IMO, preserving the clinician's intent, intention when capturing discrete and clinical data remains vital, especially in risk-sharing environments. So today we will review the following risk adjustment principles, and we'll identify long-term strategies for it to manage HCC capture, as well as talking about the importance of uh, physician documentation in HCC models and leveraging the electronic health record to support the specificity of documentation. So let's get started with an overview of risk adjusted principles. Risk-adjusted reimbursement models are used to predict future costs and subsequently payments to providers for healthcare services for covered lives or enrolled beneficiaries. While there are different models, such as CMS's Medicare Advantage or Health and Human Services, HHS, health exchange plans, the fundamental mental principles are the same. Different models represent the unique needs of the enrolled beneficiaries of each plan. And while many of the topics discussed apply to any model, our presentation is focused on Medicare Advantage plans and HCCs. The CMS HCC risk adjustment model is perspective in that it uses health status in a base year or the data collection year to predict a beneficiary's annual expected cost in the following year or payment year. There are important timeframes to consider for the model. We will look at some of these next and why they are important. Each year, CMS evaluates the model's performance against the various rules and regulations to ensure it is achieving desired results. If it is determined a change is necessary, a notice is published outlining proposed changes on their website. This document is typically known as advanced notices and depending upon the type of proposed changes, an early preview document may also be published. CMS may propose a change to any aspect of the program, including the model itself. For example, when the 21st Cures, Century Cures Act regulation outlined elements that impacted the risk adjustment models, CMS proposed changes to the model itself. The model changes were outlined along with a phased approach for implementation. Typically, phased approach implementation occurs over a period of three years for larger changes to the model. Implemented changes are published also on the website and are titled announcements. Models also receive version number in order to identify specific changes within a model. It is important to watch the yearly changes to determine impact to your patient population. And on the next slide, we will review a few proposed changes for calendar year 2023. CMS is soliciting comments on whether enhancements can be made to the CMS HCC risk adjustment model to address the impacts of social determinants of health on the beneficiary's health status by incorporating additional factors that predict the relative cost of the Medicare Advantage enrollees. 
CMS wants to focus on collecting the data that may provide more complete information when calibrating the risk adjustment model. They also would like comments on how to improve the efficiency of collecting this, this data. CMS is also placing greater emphasis on patient experience as represented via the STAR rating system. The proposed changes demonstrate CMS's commitment to identify, identifying and closing health equity gaps amongst their enrolled beneficiaries. For more details on proposed changes, please visit CMS's website. Continuing to review important timeframes, here you can see the calendar year is center for various reasons. Data collection and submission of the patient's conditions occur within the 12-month timeframe. The collected data is used to calculate individual patient scores, which translate to provider reimbursement, and the provider sees the reimbursement in the payment year. This method of predicting future utilization based upon past requires not only the collection of the data, but proper data submission. CMS has, has been evolving the submission methods as we will see next. The Risk Adjusting Processing System, or RAPS, defined reporting data elements that were centered around the dates of service and the diagnosis codes while the Encounter Data Processing System is more comprehensive and based upon typical fee-for-service billing data components. As the model now calculates 100% of the risk-adjusting payments using the Encounter Data Processing System as of this year for 2022, it is important to review the details of the Encounter Data System as it's another area to watch to ensure your data is not only accurately captured, but appropriately reported. Next, we will look at the principles of the system. We will start with the principles that drive the creation of the hierarchies. The following 10 principles guide the creation of CMS HCC diagnostic classification system. The first is the categories should be clinically meaningful as well as predict the medical expenditures. The third principle of the categories for diagnostic categories that it will affect payments should have adequate sample size to permit accurate and stable estimates of the expenditures. Principle four is in creating an individual's clinical profile, hierarchies should be used to characterize the person's illness level within each disease process. And while the effects of unrelated disease processes accumulate, because each new medical problem adds to the individual's total disease burden. However, the most severe manifestation of a given disease process principally defines its impact on cost. Therefore, related conditions should be treated hierarchically with more severe manifestations of a condition dominating and zeroing out the effect of less serious ones. This principle is related to the hierarchical interactions we will touch on more in a bit. The fifth principle is the diagnostic classification should encourage specific coding. However, the other, another principle is the classification should not reward coding proliferation. The classification should not measure greater disease burden simply because more ICD-10 CM codes are present. We will discuss this further later when we review specific documentation requirements. Principle seven is providers should not be penalized for recording additional diagnosis. This principle has two consequences for modeling. One, that no condition category should carry a negative payment weight, and two, a condition that is higher ranked in a disease hierarchy, causing the lower ranked diagnosis to be ignored, should have at least as large a payment weight as a lower rank condition in the same hierarchy. Again, this is related to the hierarchy interactions. Principle eight is the classification should be internally consistent and it should also assign all appropriate ICD-10 CM codes. And the last principle of the discretionary diagnostic categories should be excluded from payment models. Let's now look at how the principles translate to areas of the model, starting with hierarchical interaction. As patients routinely have more than one hierarchical condition, the model must account for the interactions of the levels of illness within the disease process. 
The interactions are based upon principle of the most severe manifestation of the condition in a hierarchy during the data collection period is given the credit, which means it is considered at least the same, if not higher value than the less severe condition. If a patient develops more severe level of illness, they receive credit for the higher HCC, but not both. Next, looking closer at HCCs, so based upon the guiding principles, there are currently over 85 HCCs in the CMS HCC model. Each HCC has their own relative factor known as a risk-adjusted factor. We will talk in more detail about the risk adjustment factors and it's important in a bit. The categories are ICD-10 CM based and multiple categories may apply to a single patient. It is important to note that while the model updates on a calendar year schedule, ICD-10 CM updates in April and October and it is possible due to ICD code changes that individual codes within an HCC may change within the calendar year even though the model itself does not change. And on the next slide, we will review which patient provider interactions the diagnosis are eligible to report for HCC determination. Traditionally, the system required physical face-to-face -face encounters between providers and patients for the conditions to be included in payment determinations. The pandemic brought changes in this area also. The definition of interaction between the provider and the patient expanded to include telehealth. The, first, the change was first announced in April, on April 10, 2020 on the HPMS memo. It is titled Applicability of Diagnoses from Telehealth Services for Risk Adjustment. Medicare Advantage organizations and other organizations that submit diagnosis for risk adjustment payments continue to be able to submit diagnosis for the risk adjustment that are from telehealth visits when those visits meet all the criteria for risk adjustment eligibility, which include being from an allowable inpatient, outpatient, or professional service and from a face-to-face -face encounter. An update was published January 15 of 2021. This is titled the 2019 Coronavirus Disease Pandemic continues to illustrate a need to maintain the expanded use of virtual care to reduce the risk of spreading the virus. Diagnoses resulting from telehealth services continue to meet the risk adjustment face-to-face -face requirement when the service is provided using interactive audio telecommunication simultaneously with video telecommunication to permit real-time interactive communication with the beneficiary. This use of diagnosis from telehealth services applies to both submissions to the RAPS and to those submitting to the encounter data system. The diagnoses play a key factor in determining the patient's risk-adjusted factors, which ultimately impacts reimbursement. David will show some examples of this later in the presentation. And on the next slide, we will see elements impacting the risk factors. Each HCC is assigned a risk factor adjustment and the risk fact adjustment factors or RAFs reflect the patient complexity with a numeric value. Patients may have multiple RAFs based upon their condition. And while there are specific rules built into the model to determine a patient's overall RAF score, in general, the higher the patient's numeric value, the higher the risk for the patient to utilize healthcare services. And as we will see next, it's important to know both the individual and overall RAF scores. As the RAF is multiplied by a predetermined dollar amount to set the per member per month capitated reimbursement for the next period of coverage, or more simply, the PMP, PMPM is the payment amount a provider receives for a patient during the patient payment year. Because payments are individualized, two patients within the same practice will have different payment rates based on calculated risk scores. And while risk scores are patient-specific, aggregation of the RAFs and the HCCs across a payer-defined population can serve as a key foundation for population health management. The RAF identifies the fixed revenue associated with the population, the overall health factors of the patient population are categorized the HCCs provide insight into the acute and chronic conditions of the patient population. 
So for example, knowing the percent of patients with HCC-17, which is diabetes with acute complication, versus HCC's, HCC-18, which is diabetes with chronic complications, or HCC-19, diabetes without complication, allows practices to focus in areas with the greatest impact to their patients. And as noted earlier, the higher the score, the higher the severity. All of this from the risk-adjusted factors to the individual HCC is based upon documentation. So let's look at documentation in more detail. The documentation of a patient's chronic condition and status, which impacts their overall care, is important for HCCs. Chronic conditions, including manifestations and complications, are important to capture. This slide shows a couple common examples of chronic conditions such as diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Capturing conditions that impact the overall patient management is important, such as amputation status or dependent upon different devices and treatment, as shown here. It is important to remember the acronym MEET when capturing the documentation. M is for monitor. Documentation needs to identify how the condition is being monitored. E is evaluate, and documenting the evaluation of the condition is important, while A is address, and what types of management issues is, is the condition causing and how are those being addressed, as well as treat for T. What treatment was prescribed or recommended for the condition? The provider must link the conditions and manifestations to how they impact the management of the patient. And these occur yearly as going back to the timeframes, the CMS HCC model uh, changes, can have changes each year. So let's look at a couple examples and impact of documentation. Here is a chronic condition example. The diagnosis of coronary artery disease is documented in both cases, but on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see additional specificity is also captured. The location of the coronary artery disease, along with the complicating factor of angina is captured. Management of the coronary artery disease and an angina is documented. On the left-hand side of the screen, the specificity and addressing the management of the angina with the CAD is not. And the difference in the documentation leads to differences in HCCs and ultimately the risk-adjusted factor. The undocumented left-hand side does not have an HCC determination while the right-hand side supports an HCC. Let's continue with another example. This example shows the difference in coding due to the documentation indicating the management of a colostomy. It is important to document the connection between the colostomy and the management of the patient. Again, the right-hand side of the screen contains the additional specificity, while the left-hand side does not. And as you can see, Crohn's disease itself does not generate an HCC, but the patient's colostomy status does generate the HCC. So documentation is key. And now it is time for our first poll question. How well does your current problem list support meet documentation? Very well, somewhat, not at all, I do not know. Jordan, can you launch the first poll question? All right, just a few more seconds and then I'll close the poll. Right now, June, it's uh, about 53% somewhat. All right, thank you. All right, David, about 55% somewhat and 25% said, I don't know. All right, um, June, thanks for that great background on, uh, uh, on risk programs. 
<clears throat> now that we have an understanding of just what these risk models are and why they matter, let's talk brass tacks. In order for you to be successful with your HCC or other risk programs, your providers are going to play an absolutely crucial role. With all of the things we're asking docs to do, all of this talk of optimizing reimbursement may sound a little gauche, but remember, these models are really more about managing these patients' chronic conditions and keeping them from becoming more severe. They're about providing better and more efficient care. And they're about getting your organization reimbursed appropriately for the care that you're already providing. So let's spend a few minutes talking about some tips, tricks, and tools that can demystify these risk programs for your providers. We'll talk about each of these in more detail on the coming slides, <clears throat> but success with risk programs really comes down to three things. Find the HCCs, code the HCCs, and then put some meat behind the HCCs. It's not quite as easy as all of that, though, um, and we'll, we'll get into that. Before, but before we get too far, we're going to ask one more poll question just to get a feel for which of these models you all are familiar with. Jory? Okay, so what risk programs do you currently participate in? So you can check all that apply, Medicare Advantage, Healthcare Exchange, programs of all-inclusive care for the elderly, or PACE, other commercial models, or end-stage renal disease. Let's give it a few more seconds and then we'll close. All right, David, so we're at about 90% Medicare Advantage and about 46% are other commercial models. Okay, great. Thank you all. <clears throat> all right, let me share my screen again. You are good, we see it. Okay, great, thanks. All right. The first step in the provider decision tree is, is this patient a member of a risk-based plan? And if so, which? EHRs are pretty good at this step, or at least as good as your implementation. But this step is key because it's going to unlock many of the subsequent steps. And it's pretty simple. If you're going to ask your docs to focus in on certain conditions, it's gonna to help to be able to tell them which. But it gets a little more complex since there are multiple risk programs out there and they all vary a little bit. The two most prevalent are the HCC models, CMS HCC and HHS HCC. The first, CMS HCC, is used by CMS to determine payment for Medicare Advantage plans. This is the most mature, most common risk model, now accounting for about a third of all Medicare enrollees. And based on your polls, um, it sounds like most of you are familiar. As such, it's focused on aged and disabled patients and does not include PEDS or OB conditions. HHS HCC, on the other hand, does, since it's used to determine payments for plans on the Affordable Care Act marketplace. It's designed for all ages, and unlike CMS HCC, it does include drug costs. How payments are calculated is significantly different between these two models. CMS HCC is a prospective model, meaning it looks back at the previous year to calculate the member's monthly premiums the following year. They say, essentially, if you documented that your patient had diabetes in 2021, that means you're going to have to treat that patient's diabetes in 2022, and we're going to reimburse you for it accordingly. HHS HCC is a little bit different in a couple of key ways. Payments are determined, again, based on patient risk, which is calculated largely by diagnostic complexity of the patient and demographics. But in this case, it's a concurrent model, meaning the diagnoses captured in a given time period are used to predict cost in that same time period. Second, it's more of a zero-sum game. Payments are determined based on the same demographic and diagnostic factors as CMS HCCs, but adjustments are made based on what they call a risk transfer formula, which in short takes money from plans with lower risk patients and transfers those to higher risk patients. But for the provider's practical purposes, whether it's Coke or Pepsi, it's still COLA. Uh, payments are adjusted based on the complexity of the patient's health and expected care needs such as determined by ICD-10 codes submitted and documented on their claims. The call to action is the same. Identify those conditions present on the patient's record that are part of the model, code them appropriately, and document with me. Now, as for those conditions, this is another place where the models differ, but only slightly. The HHS model includes almost 11,000 codes, while CMS includes 9,500. But there's considerable overlap 
7,200 codes are being shared by both models. So if you're tracking CMS HCC conditions well today, you may think you've got a good start on those ACA plans. And now you may be looking at this slide and being like, where's he going with that? He's saying they're both cola and that's close enough. I don't even like Pepsi. Coca-Cola is way better. And that new Coke stuff, it's terrible. And that's exactly the point. There is a difference and that difference matters. You want the right information at the right time to make the right decisions. So here at IMO, we've just released terminology support for HHS HCC, meaning that we can flag those conditions that are part of the HHS model when providers are searching for new problems and diagnoses. The next step is bringing those flags forward once the problem or diagnosis has been captured so you can track it on the patient's chart. Based on the patient's payer type, we would be able to flag those HHS HCC conditions on the patient's chart where appropriate, just as your EHR is likely flagging CMS HCCs today. Which brings us to one of the most critical pieces in this puzzle, being able to identify the patient's persistent, i.e. previously captured HCCs. This can be challenging in the EHR today because these HCCs may be documented in several different places. In order to get reimbursed for these HCCs, they need to be coded in ICD-10 and submitted with meat documentation. So it's highly likely that many of these HCCs have been captured on previous encounters and can be found in the patient's diagnosis history. However, that diagnosis history is also likely to be full of other acute diagnoses that are not part of the HCC model. We see Medicare Advantage patients with hundreds of historical diagnoses. So parsing through that list to find the HCCs is challenging to say the least. But these conditions are generally chronic and as is the intention of the HCC model, should be managed over time, which is exactly the purpose of the patient's problem list. Now the patient's problem list is really a whole webinar of its own. And in fact, we've done a couple. Um, but suffice it to say that they're currently underutilized by most providers. There are a number of reasons for this, but a major one is that they're, they're just a pain to manage. They're often just unorganized lists that are full of redundant or out of date problems, and docs just don't have the time to curate them with the tools available natively in EHRs today. Well, shameless plug, tools exist to make problem lists easier to deal with. One solution I happen to know of automatically organizes lists into clinical categories that generally align with common clinical specialties. It offers streamlined reviews, uh, streamlined workflows to identify and remove those unnecessary problems that are cluttering lists up today. And it offers face up flags to alert providers to unaddressed HCCs. If we can encourage providers to capture the patient's HCCs on the problem list, it will be much easier for them to manage going forward since the problem list really should be the entry point into the clinical case, that summary of the patient that orients the provider to the current encounter. But now the next question, how does a provider know if an HCC has already been addressed since you can only get paid for it once in a year? EHRs by now do a decent job of identifying HCCs if they've been documented on the problem list. Many of them append an HCC prefix or suffix along with the problem description, and they may even bold the entry. You may even be using alerts in your EHR to bring these to your provider's attention. But you can only get credit for an HCC once per calendar year, and further, you can only get credit for the highest diagnostic category in a given hierarchy each calendar year. So unless the rules you're using to drive those alerts or drive those flags on the problem list account for those HCC exclusion rules, you're likely over alerting your docs, which I don't think I have to tell you they do not appreciate. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Take for instance, this patient's breast cancer. It's flagged here on the problem list and it's even bright red. That's great, except when that breast cancer has already been addressed for the year. Then flagging it in red is a misnomer or the diabetes that's similarly flagged, even though there's a more complex, i.e. higher paying diabetes documented at the bottom of the list. We propose a different approach. We flag only those HCCs that have not been addressed in the current calendar year and that represent the highest RAF category in a given hierarchy. In other words, we flag only those HCCs that would affect the patient's RAF score. Further, we join all of those HCCs found in the patient's hierarchy or historical diagnoses with those on the problem list and then apply them to the HCC hierarchy. Based on the hierarchy and the dates associated with the last encounter in which they were diagnosed, we can flag just those conditions that impact the patient's RAF score. 
So we know that there might be HCCs hiding throughout your patient's chart, and I've given you a couple of obvious places to look, as well as some tools that can help you with that identification. But what about HCCs that have not already been coded in a previous encounter or have not been added to the patient's problem list? These are commonly referred to as suspect HCCs, which are suggested by other clinical data, structured or unstructured, in the patient's chart. This could be lab results or medications or vital signs or documentation in previous soap notes. There's any number of data that could suggest a suspect HCC. And since HCCs are such a growing part of many healthcare organizations' financial mix, there are any number of vendors out there who claim to be able to help you find them. This is certainly an intriguing use case for technology, and many of these vendors are using complex algorithms and AI to try to intuit the presence of HCCs and suggest them to the provider. I'm certainly not here to downplay their promise, but I would note a couple of things. One, those tools are still reliant on the underlying clinical data for accuracy. And two, if they're presenting inaccurate suggestions to the provider, your providers will quickly lose trust and the suggestions will just become another irritating alert. Again, there's a lot of promise here, but make sure that you have a high level of confidence in what's being suggested before you put those suggestions in front of your providers. Or if you fancy yourself a gumshoe, it's possible to uncover these suspect HCCs with just some good old fashioned detective work. CMS can provide a model output report, which will give you a summary of all of the HCCs submitted for your enrollees from the previous calendar year. This is a great baseline from which to start. A year over year review may also be beneficial to identify members who are missing key data. And provider scorecards may help you identify providers who commonly undercode chronic conditions. And once you identify your problem areas, you can be more proactive with provider education and targeted outreach. Speaking of undercoded chronic conditions, we've come to probably the most important aspect in improving your risk scores, coding these conditions specifically and completely. And because what would an IMO webinar be without a discussion on ICD-10 coding, am I right? Well, June touched on this briefly, but I'm going to show one more example and try to tie it back to the provider's challenges at the point of care. Let's take diabetes. Super common, super complex to code in ICD-10, and super important to your risk scores. It's also often captured on the patient's problem list under a general title of diabetes. But in the HCC world, if you're just coding diabetes, you're probably leaving a ton of money on the table. In the CMS model, there's a huge difference in RAF, about three times difference, between coding unspecified diabetes and diabetes with complications. Further, these complications should also be coded themselves and often re times represent additional RAF or HCC categories with RAF of their own. In the example I'm showing here, appropriately coding this patient's diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes mellitus with stage 4 chronic kidney disease on insulin would net you around $400 to $500 a month in additional Medicare Advantage reimbursement. And if you think about your current Medicare Advantage population and your provider's current ICD-10 coding practices, there's likely a whole lot of opportunity for you here. And I don't want to turn this into too much of an advertisement, but if you're not familiar with IMO's search tools and how we can help you capture that appropriate ICD-10 specificity and secondary codes, we should definitely connect afterward. All right, now for everyone's favorite acronym, MEAT. June touched on this a little bit, so I'll just note that, well, it's not necessarily so easy. The clinical data to support the diagnosis is often siloed and difficult to find, access, and place in the proper context. And this is really the challenge for so much of the provider's EHR experience. Well, I'm here again to tell you that there are tools available out there that can organize a patient's clinical data into the context of the problem list. So a provider can access, for example, the diabetic patient's relevant labs and medications so that the provider can access the necessary data at a click rather than digging through the entire EHR and all of those silos of data. So our key takeaways, one, provider awareness of your HCC initiatives, of the patients who are members of risk-based plans, of the tools you've put in place to help them. Um, two, making sure that those tools are giving them accurate insights with clear and actionable steps to address. But three, remember that those tools and so much of what you're trying to do at your organization is rooted in the accuracy of your patient's record. Empower your providers to become better stewards of their patient's data. And you'll see better outcomes in not just your risk programs, 
but throughout your practice. And that starts with coding. Be specific and be thorough. And be in touch. If any of this resonated and you think of some of these ideas might help your organization, we'd be happy to discuss with you and your team in more detail. Jordan will share some details on how you can get in touch with us later. But first, I believe we have some Q&A coming up. Yeah, perfect, David. Thank you. Uh, all right, so at this time, we'll be kicking off our live Q&A. So if you have any questions coming into this webinar or even what has been brought up, uh, please enter them now and our team will begin answering questions live. Uh, just a reminder that please excuse any brief silence while um, our team reviews your questions. So we actually have a few that are in the bank already. So where can I find the CMS published announcement? Hi, uh, this is June and a great question. CMS makes all of the information available online for their announcements of the changes, um, if you access that site, and then it's under the section of health plans and follow those links to identify the for the Medicare Advantage for the uh, um, CMS's HCC documentation. It's, I believe announcements and documentation is what it's titled, um, the link that shows that information. Right. And along those lines, there was a question related to the model output. Um, in general, there, uh, the information around the models, the HCCs and even the uh, codes are available in that section of CMS. Uh, if there is organizational specific information um, I would work with uh, whoever that your uh, healthcare plan is that you know ultimately administering payments to to find out what they have available um, to provide you regarding uh, your specific organization information. Awesome, thanks, June. So, is the HCC functionality already a part of IMO four? I will take that when I get off mute. Um, yes, uh, everything we showed it is. Um, the ability to flag HCCs in your, um, uh, in, when you're searching for a problem or a diagnosis, the tools to refine the uh, a, an underspecified diagnosis like diabetes to get the additional detail you need to optimize that HCC score. Um, the HCC uh, uh, ident or the, the HCC hierarchy view to be able to identify unaddressed HCCs um, versus those that have already been addressed uh, that that is also available um, as a part of IMO Core. Much of this though will depend on your vendor part or your your EHR's integration of IMO Core components. Um, some some EHRs support some features and not others. So we would have to have a discussion about your particular EHR and what your EHR supports from the IMO Core Suite. Um, the PCL or the PL support meet documentation depending on the specialty. For PC, it's good. For certain other specialties, it's not. Can you explain more on that? Yeah, um, I believe that's related to the problem list, and that is, uh, it sounds like it's a great start for uh, that having the problem list support the additional documentation for the meet criteria. Um, so that is, that is great. There's also a question related to uh, the timing between CMS and state beneficiaries if they have dual membership. Um, and if, I am not aware of a standard light of timeframes for when the states need to report that information to the, the providers. So again, I would recommend checking with whoever is administering the state benefits uh, along the lines uh, in addition, you know, for those dual eligible uh, beneficiaries to see what uh, standard timeframes they have uh, set in place since each state uh, Medicaid, you know, Medicaid or those dual eligibles operate um, their programs um, while very similarly a tad bit different at times. 
In regards to meet, do all four need to be documented in the note or just on another? Uh, um, I'll take that. Is in the the documentation needs to support that those four areas are connected um, because I, you know if you think about monitoring the conditions leads to okay how is it impacting in that assessment as well as what if any treat you know what treatments are recommended um, along those ways so they go hand in hand um, from those the aspects. And there's along that same lines about coding from the um, problem list that that is where you know having the that information as a guiding point uh, for when the conversations are happening with the patients along those lines um, to have that available and then as the encounters are occurring whether they're face to face or through the tele you know telehealth and remote that that is um, coming into play so for those areas and part of those notes. There's additional question around for Crohn's. Um, the, so in the example that I used, um, the ICD-10 code, and this is where uh, generally and CMS makes this information available as to which codes fall into which HCC um, is where that information was pulled from for the latest ICD-10 CM codes. Uh, so, you know, yes, I understand what you're saying about being the inflammatory bowel disease, but looking at how um, ICD indexes and assigns Crohn's in general, and then how that translates into an HCC category. Um, all that information can be found online, and that's where the reference for that um, that slide came from. All right, just a reminder, uh, if you have any additional questions, please enter them into the question box. And I'd like to say these are great questions and shows us some of the complexity around, around this area and managing um, these conditions and information. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to go back to the, the last question, just to just to make sure we're, we're super clear. Um, the question is, didn't think you could code from the problem list. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, you need to, HCCs need to be coded to ICD-10 and submitted on the claim along with that meet documentation. Um, it's not enough to have it on the problem list. Uh, it needs to be coded to ICD-10 and put on a claim. But uh, as June mentioned and as I mentioned earlier, um, the problem list is really a great starting point for the provider to help orient the provider to what's going on with the patient and really what the, the encounter should, should uh, be all about. So, um, having HCCs on the problem list is really just a good way to track the HCCs, but not, not the way to, to code them and submit them. That needs to be done through a claim. Uh, uh, another question here, are you planning to serve up suspects? Um, yes, yes, we are. We are looking into this. Um, but we will, again, as I, I mentioned in my slides, we want to make sure that in, in doing so, um, we're, we're really being really precise and, um, and, and delivering good suggestions there. So it is something we're evaluating. We think that there is some, uh, some good opportunity there uh, to provide some real uh, targeted you know, suggestions, really comparable to some of the work we're doing to clean up the problem list. Uh, some of the same idea to identify undocumented HCCs or HCCs that are not being tracked on the problem list and should be. Um, we, we think that there's some opportunity there and it's something we're evaluating uh, currently. All right, I think that might be the end of the questions. So we are gonna go ahead and close out for today. We hope you found the information in today's webinar useful. If you want any more information about IMO solutions, please contact your IMO client executive or email sales at imohealth.com. Thanks so much for attending and please stay safe out there.